section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman. The woman is talking to the man regarding a job in a hotel. You have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. The conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Vela Hotel. How can I help you? Hello. I read about your advertisement in the midday news. Yes, we have given more than one advertisement. Is that advertisement related to housekeeping staff? The advertisement in the newspaper is related to housekeeping staff. So, housekeeping staff is written as an answer for the example. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning, Vela Hotel. How can I help you? Hello. I read about your advertisement in the midday news. Yes, we have given more than one advertisement. Is that advertisement related to housekeeping staff? Right. I'm interested in the cleaning department. Great. Actually, I'm not dealing in this department. The person who is taking care of this department is not available today. Still, I can help you by giving you the basic details if you're interested. Oh, that will be great. What kind of staff are you looking for? The staff that we are looking for includes laundry, shoe polishing facilities, keeping the building clean, sweeping, mopping, dusting, vacuum cleaning and bathroom cleaning. Housekeeping staff also clean the windows and public areas and remove trash and deposit it into the building dumpsters. Absolutely right. Can you tell me the working hours? We have four shifts. Early morning shift from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m., morning shift from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., evening shift from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., and night shift from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. So do you give the option to the people of choosing the shift timings? Actually, we do not encourage that. The reason is that everybody would choose the shift according to their preference, but we do allow replacing one week's shift with another shift timing. I think it would be better if I note all this down. Also, can you tell me about the day off system? We offer two days off and you can change the days on every alternative week of the month. Can you please tell me regarding the payment system? Absolutely, just a moment. Yes, I have them. You get $8 per hour, which includes your break. Will I get meals or...? Yes, we offer meals to all our staff and there is no charge for it, which is a big relief. Awesome! Also, you'll be happy to know that you also get tips from our bonafide guests. What about the uniform? Is there any uniform system? I mean, do you provide the clothes as a uniform? Of course! It slipped out of my mind. We do provide clothes for the uniform. Wow, that is good! As it is difficult for one to manage one's uniform, what is the colour of the uniform? Green shirt and cream trousers, no prints, just plain. Oh, I forgot to ask about the date. From when can I join? Uh, can you hold for a minute? You can join from the first week of next month. You know the weather is improving. Perfect. I'm free from next month. Great. But I would like to inform you that you have to call again and speak with Miss Samantha Bradshaw as she's the manager who is dealing with housekeeping department. She'll guide you as to when you come for the interaction with the manager. Not a problem. What time should I call again? You can call her after two days, as on that day she'll have time to interact with you. So shall I call back on the same number? No, I'll give you her number. The number is plus zero four four eight 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 three 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 five three eight five. Okay, I will call her. Do tell her about all information which I've given you. And also, you'll be asked some verification questions. Not a problem. 
Thank you very much. You are most welcome. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You're going to hear a reporter from the New York Times who is presenting a news report prepared by Dion Cierci and Robert Gebelov on the topic Middle Class Shrinks. Further as more fall out instead of climbing up. First look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen to the recording and answer questions 11 to 13. The middle class that President Obama identified in his State of the Union speech last week as the foundation of the American economy has been shrinking for almost half a century. In the late 1960s, more than half of the households in the United States were squarely in the middle earning. In today's dollars, $35,000 to $100,000 a year. Few people noticed or cared as the size of that group began to fall because the shift was primarily caused by more Americans climbing the economic ladder into upper income brackets. But since 2000, the middle class's share of households has continued to narrow, the main reason being that more people have fallen to the bottom. At the same time, fewer of those in this group fit the traditional image of a married couple with children at home, a gap increasingly filled by the elderly. This social upheaval helps explain why the president focused on reviving the middle class, offering a raft of proposals squarely aimed at concerns like paying for college education, taking parental leave, affording childcare and buying a home. Now look at questions 14 to 21. As the talk continues, answer questions 14 to 21. Middle-class economics means helping working families feel more secure in a world of constant change, Mr. Obama told Congress and the public. Still, regardless of their income, most Americans are identified as middle-class. The term itself is so amorphous that politicians often cite the group in introducing proposals to engender wide appeal. The definition here starts at $35,000, which is about 50% higher than the official poverty level for a family of four and ends at the six-figure mark. Although many Americans in households making more than $100,000 consider themselves middle class, particularly those living in expensive regions like the Northeast and Pacific Coast, they have substantially more money than most people. However, the lines are drawn. It is clear that millions are struggling to hang on to accoutrement that most experts consider essential to a middle-class life. I would consider middle-class to be people who can live comfortably on what they earn, can pay their bills, can set aside something to save for retirement and for kids in college. 
and can have vacations and entertainment, said Christine L. Owens, executive director of the National Employment Law Project, a left learning research and advocacy group. That is the end of section two. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear an interview conducted by an interviewer speechal with a scientist, Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. First look at questions 22 to 26. Listen to the conversation and answer questions 22 to 26. Professor Pite, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote, there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa when we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope. The World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. <laughs> my only thought was, oh shit. We immediately disinfected everything and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Now look at questions 27 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 27 to 30.
In the end, you were finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, man, our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long, and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age. But I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related, unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name. But the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of section three. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear an extract from a talk given by a lecturer from management department of a university on the topic, job satisfaction. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Job satisfaction is how happy an individual is with his or her job. Scholars and human resource professionals generally make a distinction between effective job satisfaction and cognitive job satisfaction. Effective job satisfaction is the overall extent of pleasurable emotional feelings individuals have about their jobs and is different from cognitive job satisfaction, which is the extent of individual satisfaction with particular facets of their jobs, such as pay, pension, arrangements, working hours, and numerous other aspects of their jobs. At its most gender level of conceptualization, job satisfaction is simply how content an individual is with his or her job. Effective job satisfaction is usually defined as a one-dimensional subjective construct representing an overall emotional feeling individuals have about their job as a whole. Hence, effective job satisfaction for individuals reflects the degree of pleasure or happiness their job in general induces. Cognitive job satisfaction is usually defined as being a more objective and logical evaluation of various facets of a job. As such, Cognitive job satisfaction can be one-dimensional if it comprises evaluation of just one aspect of a job, such as pay, 
or maternity leave or multidimensional if two or more facets of a job are simultaneously evaluated. Environmental factors. One of the most significant aspects of an individual's work in a modern organization concerns the management of communication demands that he or she encounters on the job. Demands can be characterized as a communication load. Individuals in an organization can experience communication overload and communication underload, which can affect their level of job satisfaction. Communication overload can occur when an individual receives loads of message in a short period of time, which can result in unprocessed information or when an individual faces more complex messages that are more difficult to process. Due to this process, given an individual's style of work and motivation to complete a task, when more inputs exist than outputs, the individual perceives a condition of overload which can be positively or negatively related to job satisfaction. In comparison, communication under load can occur when messages or inputs are sent below the individual's ability to process them. According to the ideas of communication overload and underload, if an individual does not receive enough input on the job or is unsuccessful in processing these inputs, the individual is more likely to become dissatisfied, aggravated and unhappy with their work that leads to a low level of job satisfaction. Now look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen to the second half of the recording and answer questions 37 to 40. Superior subordinate communication. Superior subordinate communication is an important influence on job satisfaction in the workplace. The way in which subordinates perceive a superior's behavior can positively or negatively influence job satisfaction. Communication behavior such as facial expression, eye contact, vocal expression, and body movement is crucial to the superior subordinate relationship. Nonverbal messages play a central role in interpersonal interactions with respect to impression formation, deception, attraction, social influence, and emotional bonding. Individuals who dislike and think negatively about their supervisor are less willing to communicate or have motivation to work, whereas individuals who like and think positively of their supervisor are more likely to communicate and are satisfied with their job and work environment. A supervisor who uses nonverbal immediacy, friendliness, and open communication lines is more likely to receive positive feedback and high job satisfaction from a subordinate. Strategic employee recognition. Employee recognition is not only about gifts and points. It's about changing the corporate culture in order to meet goals and initiatives, and most importantly, to connect employees to the company's core values and beliefs. Strategic employee recognition is seen as the most important program, not only to improve employee retention and motivation, but also to positively influence the financial situation. The vast majority of companies want to be innovative, coming up with new products, business models, and better ways of doing things. However, innovation is not so easy to achieve. A CEO cannot just order it and so it will be achieved. You have to carefully manage an organization so that, over time, innovations will emerge. Individual factors Mood and emotions form the effective element of job satisfaction. Moods tend to be long-lasting, but often weaker states of uncertain origins, while emotions are often more intense short-lived and have a clear object or cause. Positive and negative emotions were also found to be significantly related to overall job satisfaction. It was found that suppression of unpleasant emotions decreases job satisfaction 
and the amplification of pleasant emotions increases job satisfaction. There are two personality factors related to job satisfaction, alienation and locus of control. Employees who have an internal locus of control and feel less alienated are more likely to experience job satisfaction, job involvement and organizational commitment. The characteristics like high self-esteem, self-efficacy and low neuroticism are also related to job satisfaction. That is the end of section 4. Now you have some time to check your answers.